has anyone lived in the UK, United Kingdom, or is anyone really familiar with how the British system of government works? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Even researching it, I realized that viewing it from Americans' eyes and trying to explain everything in my own language really did not do it justice. So probably some of the things I'm going to describe are not 100% accurate, but maybe 99. And it's just because I'm looking through my eyes and I don't think I have the British experience, which I think you really need to have. Just like to be American, you need to be American to maybe, or live here for a while to really understand how and why our system is working the way it is right now. So before we start, like most European countries, like most countries, the official name of the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And it's made up of four countries. Notably, Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom, but it is made up of Wales, England, Northern Ireland, and Scotland. The, the British government, like we think of in the US, we have the three big functions of government, or the three, three big pillars of government. The British government has two that you really hear about, the Crown and the Parliament. You don't really hear about the Supreme Court as a check and balance like we do in the United States. Jay Leno had a joke where he talked about um, the role of the crown and how the crown is just a figurehead, and he compared it to the United States of the crown not having real, really any power, kind of like our vice president. <laughs> I don't think that's the case, and if there's anything I want to separate today is that the crown is not just a figurehead. That's debatable, but that's what I believe. So I listed here some of the things that the Crown is responsible for. Appointed ambassadors. They do this on recommendation from the staff, from the Prime Minister, but that is a role that they have. The Commander-in-Chief of the military. Obviously, the Queen is not out directing ships and armies, but that is a role that she officially has. <coughs> in fact, all ships in the, naval, in the British Navy are HMS, Her Majesty's ships. Appoints judges in England and, and Wales appoints many members to the House of Lords, if not all of them, and we're going to get to what the House of the Lords is, and has veto power over all acts of Parliament. She has not used this power in 300 years, but it is a power that she does have. The House of Parliament is the other big function of the British government, and it's made up of two parts, the House of the Lords and House of the Commons. The House of the Lords as we mentioned before, is largely appointed, the members are largely appointed by the Queen. Up until 2009, they were the Supreme Court, but in 2009, they separated that function out to a separate Supreme Court. So that's why the Supreme Court is not really a big function like it is here in the US there, because it was part of the House of Lords, which was part of the House of Parliament, and is a relatively new, separate entity. The House of Commons is where all the drama's been going on. When you see Brick says it, Brick Brexit, um, debates and when you see all the stuff on TV, this is where the drama happens. This is where the laws are made. This is where, um, this is where you see the, the TV cameras. The House of the Lords really acts as a check and balance. The members are appointed by the Queen and they look at all the laws and they look at the things that come from the House of Commons and they do a sanity check. They can delay things. In some circumstances, they can maybe push back. They really have no power to change um, acts that come through them. And from there, it goes to the queen for signature. And she is apolitical, and so she pretty much signs what the people have said that they want. The House of Commons is where the drama is. So the way this works is that the British people choose MPs, members of parliament. And so that is their representative. Once they choose the MPs, the, the MPs come from parties. The party that gets to 326 members, they actually choose the prime minister. And from there, the prime minister chooses the cabinet. So the people don't directly elect their prime minister. They elect the members who then elect the prime minister. So like, unlike in the US, you wouldn't have a figurehead of the government who's from a different party than the majority in the House of Parliament or the House of Commons. That has not stopped the drama. You still have people <laughs> jumping party lines and making different decisions. But it is an important distinction of why the British system is different or how the British system is different. So the role of the prime minister is they run the government, they do the day-to-day -day operations, and if you ever watch The Crown on Netflix, they meet with the Queen weekly. So it's a very important function. They also choose the cabinet members, which are also MPs. And so it will almost be like if you had a senator who was also the Secretary of Defense. 
their system is they don't look outside of those people who've been democratically elected to fun hold those um, important functions of government. So the House of Commons, another big difference is that there are nine different parties within the British system. So you have the Conservatives and the Labour Party. These are the ones, the names that have been making up in the news. The Conservative Party, Conservative Party is similar to our Republicans. The Labour Party is similar to our Democrats. And then you have different parties who come from different areas, some from Ireland, Scottish National Party, and they all have different interests. As you can see, no member, no group reached 326. So in this current government, they have what they call a coalition government. And here, the Conservatives partnered with the Democratic Unionist Party to form a coalition government. And the Prime Minister, Theresa May, obviously, is from the Conservative Party. This was actually a lot of drama. It may not sound like it, but the Democratic Unionist Party is similar to our Tea Party. They don't really believe in gay marriage. They're anti-abortion. Very, very conservative. They're from Northern Ireland. So much further right than the Conservative Party. So for the Conservative Party to reach to that party to actually partner to form a coalition government was actually a really big deal. One of the reasons why they did that was they're both for Brexit. So in order for Brexit to go through, these two parties had to come together to form the coalition government. The other parties are kind of in between. And so as you can see, this actually did not stop the, Brexit, the latest Brexit vote from failing because there are conservative members who were not in favor of the proposal that went forward. The Speaker of the House, it was actually an NPR talk about him, has a very important role, apolitical. He does come from a party, but he, his role is to remain, keep order in the House, censure members, and he actually chooses what issues to come forth. So he has a subtle part, power that he can utilize to influence how the House of Commons works. But it is um, an apolitical power. So in conclusion, the three takeaways. The queen is more than just a figurehead. She actually does have a role in the government. And I think that role is more than what us Americans can see, or me, I can see as an American, to the British people. She has actually a very important role. The government's changed. The parliament changes. But the queen is an institution that the people can look to throughout all of those changes. There are many cons uh, constituencies in the United Kingdom. They don't have a two-party system, so they actually have multiple constituencies, multiple different countries that, that they have to please, and that's one thing that's making Brexit more complicated. And finally, the UK has a flexible system that has changed a lot to meet the modern needs. They have went from a, queen, a monarchy, and they've transformed that system, keeping a lot of the same parts to become a democratic country. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. She's doing awesome. the double bump that Obama and Michelle do. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> My role is to evaluate Jonathan Fowler's fourth speech. I want to congratulate him on moving along so well on the British system of government. And of course I'm going to assimilate and bring positive acclaim to your speech because it was wonderful. And your opening was great. You asked us all how much we knew about the British government, and you discerned that we knew little. <laughs> and your speech was to inform us with research, which you did very well, about the British government. And you did that in a number of ways. We were on this evaluation for number four in the pathways is you're supposed to have a film, unfamiliar topic, which clearly you were right on there, and you were supposed to have trend, it's supposed to be well organized, which it was with your PowerPoints, and you're supposed to have a good transition between the sections. And you're supposed to use and cite the sources. I'm not positive you said where your sources were for all this wonderful information, but you presented it well. I personally loved the map of the British Isles at the beginning with the colors that outlined what Ireland wasn't and the British Isles were. Your explanations were very good with um, Her Majesty's ships 
le leading to your conclusion, which I loved, which I'll get to. Uh, your first PowerPoint being black and white, I thought, oh, it's a little boring. But, and it was up a little long. The first one had about six points. That might have been broken into two. But the reason you used black and white was your color coding at the end of the different sections of the British government. And I thought that was particularly excellent. And when you explained the role of the prime minister and the different pe people, including the Speaker of the House, and compared the conservatives with our, Democrat, our Republicans and the Liberals, Labor Party, with our liberal, more um, Democrats, was very good. <coughs> you had the numbers for those there. When you mentioned Brexit, you might have given a slight definition of exactly what Brexit is and what the controversy is about it still today. Your conclusion was heartfelt. The Queen is more than a figurehead. You know, because we all see pictures of Queen Elizabeth still today in her 90s, she must be. And your many contingencies were better, were good. Your timing was a little over, but that's because it was such a full speech and gave us so much information on the British system of government. Thank you. Thank you.